Welcome to the latest podcast in a series from the internationalist in the ANA. I'm Brendan Banaham, Managing Director of the Internationalist Group of Companies. We focus on the reinvention of marketing by connecting the people and ideas in international marketing through content, insights, thought leadership, community collaboration, and consulting. Today's podcast shares how people in our global community are not merely handling today's pandemic crisis, but helping us all to better navigate it. The ability to inspire people to be their best is valuable in difficult time, and no one does this better than marketers. I'll now turn the podcast over to Deborah Malone, founder of The Internationalist. Thanks, Brendan, and welcome to another Internationalist Trendsetter show. Sir Martin Sorrell's success has always been built on anticipating what's next for an advertising industry that must continually reinvent itself. His company, S4 Capital, has had quite a year, with seven acquisitions to date since the first COVID-19 lockdown began last March. This includes two recent U.S. acquisitions in early January, integrated media agency Decoded, and marketing agency Metric Theory. Today, we're talking with him about his views of the advertising and marketing business, new geographic balances, and what's ahead for an industry that needs to validate growth. Welcome to the show. Delighted to be with you, Deborah. Me me in London and you in Vermont. Me after my injection yesterday, which knocked me sideways overnight. Didn't get a wink of sleep, but... uh, So I don't want to scare anybody from, who's, who's worried about vaccinations, but for me, it was deeply unpleasant last night. So anyway, so I've recovered. Oh, thank yeah. goodness. Thank goodness. Well, now that, well, now that we've, we've mentioned COVID in an overt way, right. let, let's start with just some basics um, and see if I can relate them to COVID. Um, you've described S4 as a new era digital advertising and marketing services company. Has that right. definition changed in the midst of COVID, or has it taken on new meaning? Well, I mean, I, it hasn't changed. I mean, if if, if a, a meaning can accelerate, or I guess deepen, uh, uh, deepen and uh, broadening, it hasn't broadened. It's the same things, you know, first party data, uh, defining content that we produce, personalized at scale, distributed through digital media in a continuous loop. We call it the Holy Trinity model. And that model has become more and more relevant uh, as a result of COVID. And COVID has accelerated digital transformation at three levels, consumer level. You know, we shop online. We educate our kids online. We do our financial services online. I mean, you, you sitting in Vermont will be doing a lot of the things online that you, you never did before. 30% of U.S. households at the very beginning of COVID started to use online services for essentials and groceries for the first time. So that was one. The second was media. All the the trends that we saw, positive and negative, you know, the streamers, mm-hmm. Netflix, Disney Plus going now to, what, 240 million subscribers, probably the most successful new product launch that we've ever seen, actually. I mean, kudos to Bob Iger and everybody else there that they managed to do this, uh, particularly at a, at a time like uh, – COVID. Uh, so you've seen that and you've seen obviously the decline, the the existential decline of newspapers and magazines. And you see the dog fights that are taking place from a regulatory point of view, for example, in Australia. You know, on one hand, News Corp closing 140 titles. And on the other hand, uh, the, the media going after both Google and Facebook uh, through the ACCC. So you, you've seen that uh, outdoor, uh, classic outdoor being eclipsed by digital outdoor. That's the second area. And then the third area is enterprise digital transformation acceleration, where companies who before perhaps were a little bit iffy about digital transformation and not sure, COVID-19 blew a hole through their profits and their models in Q2 of last year. So they almost have no choice but to embark upon digital transformation, particularly as analog companies trying to become digital and accelerate. So the the most common thing that we hear is our 24 plan or 23 plan is being activated in 21. So uh, I would say, Deborah, that that it hasn't taken on a new meaning. It just taken on uh, an increasing depth and urgency. So the S4 model, which is built Mm -hmm. around 
to create that new age, new era model and disrupt the old because we think the old are, are not fit for purpose anymore. You know, WPP and Omnicom and Publicis and IPG Havas, uh, uh, Dentsu are not fit for purpose anymore uh, and ultimately probably should be broken up. But it, there is need for a new model. I mean, for example, there was an article in Fast Company uh, I think the last couple of days about the rise of these new creative boutiques, which you know, I thought was an interesting article, but it really didn't really deal with what's happening that's new because really those smaller digital uh, creative boutiques are people who were frustrated with the holding company model, left, took a piece of business with them. I mean, the lead story is about MDC losing a piece of business to this startup. It's not really what we're doing because we're purely digital. Mm -hmm. We have this holy trinity model of data driving content and digital media. We're faster, better, cheaper, which we'll come on to in due course. Uh, Agility, understanding tech better than anybody else, all the vagaries and ups and downs and uh, inflows and outflows. And then cheaper, meaning more efficiency. And the fourth point is a unitary structure. No silos and everybody working together, much misused word, seamlessly. Uh, when we use it, we mean it, and it's been a fundamental founding principle of the firm since inception two and a half years ago. So I would say net-net what COVID's done, sadly, because it's been such a terrible thing, you know, having killed two million people on data that we're told is true but probably understates the true position. Uh, this terrible thing, uh, if there is any uh, any lesson from it, it is, is it has accelerated the growth at consumer level, media level, and enterprise level. No, it, it's interesting. You you mentioned a fourth point, which I think might be worth talking a little bit more about. Yeah. Um, when you said no silos and seamless, I assume that means one P and L. Is is that the yes. magic of that? Um, of how that is? Yeah, created? So, yeah I mean, yeah. every everybody talks about that. You know, the heads of the holding companies. Uh, um, the people running, you know, they, they, they blather on about it. But, you know, the, the simple fact of the matter is they don't run the companies that way. They have, uh, they, they plan and budget by silo. We plan and budget as a firm. And all, all our incentives, uh, quant- qualitative incentives and quantitative, are built around one P&L and no BS, so that, you know, from the beginning. So our priorities for 2021, we have three. One is to bed down the big account wins that we had uh, around Mondelez and BMW Mini in particular, but the, you know, our top five, what we call whoppers, this is clients with more than $20 million of revenue. So we have Google, we have a telecoms company, which I'm not allowed to talk about publicly with NDA, but you can guess who it is, um, uh, one of the most valuable companies on the planet, if not the most or close to the most. Um, thirdly, uh, BMW Mini or Mondelez, we'll see how that shakes out whether they're third or fourth. Uh, and then finally, Facebook. So our top five and 55% of our revenues you know, are, are tech. And uh, what, what, what we've done since the very beginning, when we've had these four principles, the fourth of which is the unitary one PL, everything we do, every, the planning we do is as one firm. We have two practices, one around content, one around data and analytics and digital media. But everything is as one firm. And our priorities for 2021 are first to bend down those accounts I mentioned. Secondly, to launch our unitary branding, which uh, we're, we're going to do shortly. So it's, this weekend was the 20th anniversary of Media Monks. Uh, and wow. we'll shortly la- launch uh, a brand uh, built for Media Monks, for Mighty Hive, and for our, the other firms that form part of, uh, part of S4 around Firewood and Circus uh, uh, and others where we think they're, they're important. So everybody will get from the brand their own individual uh, satisfaction, but it will be one brand. So that's the second priority. And the third one is continue to build our services as we've done in the first few weeks of the year. You know, We've brought uh, three or four uh, different companies in in the early weeks of the year, because partly because it was a post-Brexit surge, but also mm-hmm. because... We like to start the year uh, on a high note, uh, and so we're probably now, as a result of those uh, those mergers, as we call them, probably about 20, 25% bigger than when we started the year. So uh, it starts the year very strongly. We'll have organic growth this year. We're budgeting at 
25%. Our target is to double the size of the company within three years. We have three three-year plans, one from uh, 19 to 21, one from 20 to 22, one from 21 to three, and each of them has called for a, a doubling. And despite COVID last year, you'll see our results, uh, I think on March the 18th, but we had a strong fourth My birthday. quarter. Uh, <laughs> and, and so you know, we did very well in a, a year when the holding companies were going back uh, probably f- somewhere between 5 and 10%, and you'll see where we ended up. Uh, so we were there's a considerable delta between ourselves and the traditional model. So all the expansion, all the new companies, they're all within this realm of data content yes. and and technology. So you're you're yes. you're continuing with that. It's not expanding beyond that. But it looks like some of them no. are are expanding media monks or mighty hive. So are they always going to be the two hubs or no, you'll, you'll see, as I say, a unitary yeah. brand that brings them together together mm-hmm. with the key elements inside the company, like Firewood, like Circus, mm-hmm. and, and others. Uh, so other people, so everybody can identify with the unit, unitary brand. But no, our, our, our philosophy is really purely digital, but focusing on those three areas. I mean, first-party data has come to the fore, as you know, and your mm-hmm. your viewers and listeners know, uh, first-party data with the mixing of third-party cookies by Google over a two-year period, uh, and with what Apple is doing uh, from a uh, point of view. Uh, this is making the importance of first-party data even greater, and the importance of the signals, because as a result of what's happening, the demise of third-party cookies, our clients are being forced back to the platforms. And the six most important ones being Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, TikTok. Uh, and, and you would add in Twitter, Pinterest, and Snap, and, and others. But there's those six platforms, three Western, three Eastern, you know, Tencent now approaching a trillion dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Pony Ma has become the second richest um, um, entrepreneur in China. Um, so, so you know, you know, we're very focused on that, and that will continue. That will continue to be our our driver. I mean, we will add. You know, we added a fashion speciality group. We've added other capabilities. We're looking at other other capabilities around e-commerce and and others. But essentially, what we're trying to do is to use those three pillars, or actually two pillars: one around content one around data and analytics and digital media. So those two, and that's Media Monks and Mighty High, but now they're coming together uh, as one. Uh, and we're, we operate very effectively as one. I mean, our, our eight key people meet every day, as, a, as I did today, despite, despite the vagaries of my, my vaccination last night. We met at 2 o'clock. You know, we have uh, two people in Singapore, three uh, in Amsterdam, one in London, uh, one in... Um, in uh, Denver uh, and one in Scottsdale, and we meet uh, every day, and we spend you know time, probably half an hour, forty five minutes, talking about our people, obviously with COVID. Uh, secondly, our clients, and thirdly, our finances. So we, you know, we we uh, but we operate as one, and, and there's a, you know very and we're only four thousand people, but you know in, we, in comparison to the holding companies, yeah, yeah that's a much smaller. Uh, or smaller group, so in essence, it's easier to do it. But I think the holding company, what the holding companies do have done, they talk about simplification and shrinking, and you know they are getting smaller all the time. But but essentially, what they do is they really entrench the verticals. So the people running the different brands, although they talk about trying to create one firm, you know, one Dentsu or the power of one at Publicis. And, you know, when you visit their offices, you take a picture of their, their, their lobbies or their, you know, receptions, they say power of one, for example, in the case of publicists, and they have 26 different company names. So you, you have all these silos who effectively work against one another. I mean, for a pitch, they may wear, they may wear tie-dyed T-shirts, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't end up with people working as one because there's a land grab as soon as they win the business there's a land grab grab for various parts of the of the business so being one having a unitary brand and having one pnl we think is absolutely critical that's why the old model is a busted flush and 
you know, mer- we talk about mergers where we, you know, we, we, we're trying to find people who are like-minded, who, who want to create a new age, new era, advertising and marketing services model and disrupt the old. So there's missionary zeal here. You know, this is really important. It may sound a bit, a bit, bit peculiar, but it isn't. We're men and women on a mission. So we're looking for people who want to do that. And we're looking for people who don't want to sell their businesses. You know, we say to them, you want to sell, go and talk to Accenture. But if what we're looking for is people who want, you know, perfectly respectable to cash in half of your equity investment for cash. The other half is rolled into our company and half the company, which is now capitalized at four, around $4 billion, half of it is owned by people inside the business. So we have, you know, I think this is a critical issue. I mean, a lot of people, the holding companies are good examples of the people who lead them pontificate about, uh, you know, what's happening and this, that, and the other. Uh, they don't have the money where the mouth is. They have options or restricted stock. They haven't gone out and borrowed or uh, leverage themselves up uh, in order to invest in the business. And I think that's a critical issue, the separation of ownership and control. And when we look at businesses, we have four criteria. One is top-line growth. Two is good margins. Three is uh, no, no susceptibility to technological change. So we're not an ad tech or one tech company. We're part of the service layer. And the fourth is management ownership. We think it's key for management to own the firm. So no separation or own very significant parts of the firm. No separation between ownership and control, we think is absolutely critical. No, that is certainly a new model. And I'd I'd like to talk a little bit more about new models, but you mentioned something that was interesting with your phone call with all the regions of the world. I I remember when we were at the WFA in in Lisbon, um, you you had opened Asia. I think during that yes. week. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about are there parts of the world that that you're yeah. in your post brick and your post Brexit yeah. uh, splurge that that yeah. matter? And I, I also yeah. just might say one thing in that I remember during I, I hate the term the Great Recession, but around two thousand eight, I recall that you said never give up on America. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious if, if, as you talk about regions, if, if that still might hold true. <laughs> no, no, I think no, I never underestimate America, although, you know, it's going to be very difficult for America to come to terms with the fact that China will be bigger in 2028. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things about COVID that everybody, you know, it's uncomfortable, I think, for America to, to get their minds around this, whether from whichever side of the house or aisle they come from. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, China almost inevitably, well, not on a per capita basis, it will take many, many years for China on a per capital base, basis to be bigger. But uh, certainly by 2028, it's as though China would big, be the biggest economy. And COVID, I mean, China, whatever you think about the Chinese, China have dealt with COVID pretty well. They have some challenges now with, in several years, and people are not traveling as much with Chinese New Year as they would normally do, even domestically, uh, you know, they will come out of this. And, and part, because of the pressure on China, you have this, um, you know, it's a professor at the London School of Economics, a woman, uh, she calls it techno-nationalism. But what we've noticed is the millennials, the Chinese millennials, think America, uh, you know, uh, China is for the Chinese. And what we've noticed, it's very interesting, we've noticed that uh, the, the holding companies are suffering in China as a result. We've noticed that Chinese companies, multinational, regional, local, rather deal with Chinese service companies than multinational. So as a result of this breach of this the Cold War decoupling, you know, people don't like to talk about it this way, but I'm afraid it is the case. I'm not going to change Biden, President Biden. You know, he may be more predictable, maybe more multilateral than, than President Trump, but, you know, it's going to be the same direction. And President Xi is taking China in a different direction, despite his speech at, at Davos uh, a day or so ago about, um, you know, with a number of fundamental principles in it. Um, you know, I think inevitably it's an issue. But coming back to America, America will always be important. I mean, currently we have 70% North and South America, so... It, when it, it's the Americas, so North and South, because we think Latin America is really interesting. Because Latin America has a bit more inflation, 
So our clients have a little bit more wiggle room. The other thing about Latin America, which is great, is they have tremendous creative talent, particularly in places like Buenos Aires and San Paulo and uh, Mexico City, but particularly, I think, Buenos Aires and San Paulo. Uh, they have great creative talent and great technological talent. Uh, you know, BA, uh, Buenos Aires or San Paulo are very good examples of that as well. You know, lots of unicorns being built there because they're very strong. There were some great companies like Globant and uh, Mercado Libre have been built there, uh, but also, you know, they're building uh, startups as well. So, uh, yeah, I would say the America is now 70%. Western Europe, uh, EMEA, uh, Middle East and Africa is about 20%, and 10% is Asia Pacific. Now, where we want to get to is 40, 20, 40. So what that means is we're acknowledging the importance of China and India in particular. I mean, Australia will remain important, New Zealand. Japan will remain important. Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, uh, ASEAN, Southeast Asia, all of these countries, the Philippines, all of them will remain important. But India and China are going to be the big drivers. And we want to have big businesses in both. In China, we we build up uh, with an agency called Tomorrow. It's been voted two years in a row by Campaign uh, Independent Agency of the Year in China, and, and Media Monks, who we've merged it with to double our size in Shanghai. Media Monks was voted Production Agency of the Year by Campaign in 2019. So uh, we brought together two really strong agencies, and we have a, a, a doubled up base there, but it's still not big enough. In India, very interestingly, we've just taken over CFPC TV18 studio in New Delhi, We've got about 250 people in India. We think we will double by the end of the year because we're, we're using the epic Fortnite Unreal Engine technology now to create material, uh, digital material. Uh, we can basically shoot ads from anywhere in the world in that studio in New Delhi. I mean, using the, the, the technology that Fortnite developed, epic developed for the Fortnite game, Mm -hmm. Uh, The technology is called, as I said, the Unreal Engine. So we're expanding in India and China. uh, But, you know, some of the things we did earlier this year was decoded or metric theory. These are U.S. businesses that we're, you know, bringing into the the fold. So the U.S. has become even more important. But I would still say... Never underestimate America. I mean, the the difficulty, and this is a real difficulty... uh, is having a balance between the two biggest economies in the world, China uh, and and the US. And it's very difficult, given the decoupling, given the split, given the techno-nationalism, given the policies of President Obama, President Trump, President Biden, uh, President Xi. I mean, they're they're going in, I think, diverging, sadly, and I think it's, it's a real problem, diverging directions. So governments have to choose which way to go, uh, and companies almost have to choose which way they go. So it's a really difficult balancing act, and um, probably for American companies, it's going to get even more doing those sanctions, tariffs, mm-hmm. friction, uh, and, and the Chinese, of course, have, have, you know, are fighting, fighting on a number of fronts, you know, Taiwan, Hong Kong, yes, Australia, India. I mean, it, it, it's tough stuff. And um, as somebody who's trying to build a global business, um, it's not as easy as it was when we started WPP in 1985, just after Deng Xiaoping's uh, speeches. It wasn't just one speech. It was a series. But his most famous speech, I think, was actually in 1985. And I went to China for the first time in 1986, 87. And we built a, a business which had, what, 16,000, 17,000 people in China. I think they've shrunk it to about 10. Uh, that's through the sale of Kantar, and I think because it's fallen back. Uh, but, you know, we, we had a 20% share in China. And in India, we had a 50% share with roughly the same number of people. So we're starting from a much smaller base, and I'd like to do something pretty spectacular in both markets. The other issue for us... Uh, Deborah, is that we, we have a transparent model. And China you know, lacks transparency. Uh, President Xi actually made it part of the report card of the SASAC, that's the government-controlled SOEs, 
you know, if you were chairman of one of the SASAC companies, uh, one of the SOEs, in your report card every year, you, you would be a corruption index. Otherwise, you, you'd taken corruption down or, or out or eliminated it. And I, I went to the Harvard Business School of China in Shanghai and listened to, we had a dialogue with some of the SASAC CEOs. It was really interesting, it must have been about five, six, seven years ago. And how the, the the CEOs were being evaluated on their ability to eliminate corruption. You know that part of President Xi's original platform is an important part of his programs. But you know, I think net net uh, that is going to be difficult. But I'd love to have uh, a four twenty forty spread. That doesn't mean, by the way, that I think Western Europe is unimportant. It is important. We've opened up in Germany with Saud, uh, which we merged with. It's the last thing we've we on the content side a couple of weeks ago, and that takes us into Germany. We have to have better presences in Germany and France and Italy and Spain. Uh, we've got a strong business in all of those markets and in the UK, but we need to be uh, to have greater heft. But having said that, you know the the sad thing I think is that if you look at Western Europe as a proportion of global GDP, it's been on the decline for a number of years. So the growth, coming to the heart of your question, is the Americas, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East and Africa. Maybe some parts of Eastern Europe too, but but certainly Middle East and Africa, Asia Pacific, and the Americas. Well, it's interesting that you say that because it, it certainly poses challenges for global clients, for global marketers in, in many ways, as you mentioned, you know, whether it's regulatory or, or just having to cope with what governments may or may not want. You've talked a lot about how agencies need to change, obviously. Yeah. What about what about the clients? What about the marketers? Um, how how do they respond to all of this? How do they also work with their agencies in, in this whole new era that's being built? Well, I, I, you know, I think there's sort of two or three things that I think clients, if I can be so bold, should be, should be doing. First of all, they should be taking that control. That, that may sound odd from mm-hmm. an agency or services person. I think they, they, they gave up too much control. You know, the, the vogue after the great financial crisis was uh, zero-based budgeting, you know, root out the cost, outsource it. And I think they, they they lost marketing skill. Uh, you know, finance and procurement grew in stature, marketing lost stature, partly because it was outsourced too much. And what you had to do really was was develop more resources. So take back control, just like Brexit and the British votes are taking back control from Brussels. Brussels marketers must take back control. So that's one thing. The second thing is I think, They've got to have agility. I mean, related to that, you, you will have better agility if you have more control of the process. You know, uh, calling up the agency and saying, uh, you know, we'll meet next week to uh, discuss a brief. And then the following week, you get another, you know, you discuss the brief, you may turn the brief back. And you can't do it. You have to produce this stuff in real time. And it, it, it may not be perfect. You know, you may produce, you know, we do work for Netflix, so we produce you know 1.6 million different creative executions for one of their series, and we see more and more. Um, you know, Netflix do a really good job, I think. I think the Netflix model is a really interesting model. I mean, they, they've become even more sophisticated recently. You know, they know what you're watching or what what you've watched, and they suggest uh, alternatives or something new that that comes along. Or did you enjoy it? whatever it happens to be, they're building that relationship, which is so important. But you create content at scale. Uh, you know, in one case, I can think, oh, we created 1.6 million creative executions. And, you know, if Deborah likes, uh, you know, business, we know she looks at the WSJ.com, so we'll use use that. If uh, And we'll compare the series that we're trying to promote uh, to a business. Or you're on the Manchester United football side to a sports team or football or whatever happens to be. So we, we try and tailor the content uh, to what to to what we're doing, so I, I, I think agility, so take back control, agility, responding fast, you know, moving from analog to digital, is critically important. And then a much more specific point is the importance of first party data. I mean, you, you, the simple fact is, third party cookies are, are on their way out. 
and all the data that our clients have, the first part, the stuff they own, you know, and, you know, the privacy issue is obviously a very important issue. And, 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 and consumers have to understand that they, they what, what they do when they sign up for the sites. You know, we, when was the last time you or anybody watching or listening to this, you know, actually sent the agreement or read the agreement before they did accept? And the answer is we don't do that. But, you know, we as an industry must treat consumers as adults and, and maybe even give them the opportunity to sell their data if they wish. But the importance of first-party data, integrating all the databases that we have, you know, if companies that we work with, you know, clients have grown by acquisition, they have different systems or they even have different people in different parts of their organizations uh, using different systems. And uh, so I think it, it needs, it needs uh, first-party data and using the signals from the six platforms that I mentioned, you know, from Google, mm-hmm. from Facebook, from Amazon, from Tencent, from Alibaba and TikTok is critically important together with the first-party data. So a lot of the work that we do is not brain surgery. You don't have to be an Einstein. A lot of the data analytics is sorting out the data, different data lakes and bringing them mm-hmm. together into more coherent yeah. form. So, so it, th- those are the three things. I, I really think. take back control. Mm-hmm. You you have yeah. to have you know an, a twenty four seven always on world. You have to have more resources internally. We will do in in house. You know the the, the the holding companies are terrified of in housing because they think they lose a the job. We don't look at it that way. If we think it's in the interest of the client to in-house media or content, whatever it is, or data analytics, we will do it with them. You know, our case study around Sprint is a Harvard Business School case study. Our client, Bayer, was voted in-houser of the year last year. So you know, we've got a, a great track record. We're now doing it for, for T-Mobile, the new parent uh, of Sprint. So we have a great track record of doing this at scale. So one, one is take back control. Secondly is agility. And third, is the importance of first-party data, corralling all that data and making it usable in an effective way. So does that mean, particularly with the emphasis on first-party data, are we going to see more brands simply going direct to consumer to satisfy some yes, of those needs? Yes, yeah. yes, yes yeah. because, because... There's when, no when, other when choice. All, no, when, when all this happened, you know, when the web came along, I think our clients rejoiced because they thought, oh, Instead of having to go through uh, Tesco or Walmart or Carrefour, they'd have a direct relationship with you and me. But then along came the e-tailers, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and Amazon or, or whatever, and, and they're the new Tesco or the new Walmart, new Carrefour, probably an even bigger force. So, you know, if Amazon is creating its own, you know, if I'm in the cosmetic business and Amazon has Lady Gaga Cosmetics um, or, you know, that, that shoe, I can't remember the shoes that, uh, Obama war, you know, and Amazon recreates uh, Allbird, recreates that as a cheaper price. I mean, you know, what you have to do is to you have to establish a relationship with the the consumer directly that is an intimate and valuable relationship. So, direct consumer becomes critically important. I mean, you have an on, omni-channel approach. You're using retail, you're using online, you're doing everything. But having that direct relationship, which which the online plat- platforms enable you to do, is critically important. And, you know, this gets into very difficult territory because, you know, in the walls in the wall garden started to go up quite significantly in 2016 with brand safety, interference in elections, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. Uh, privacy issues. And and our clients lost traction, so they've had to reestablish it. And now with third-party cookies being mixed, it becomes even more important. So it's absolutely critical. I mean, I remember just before COVID, like my last trip, I, I went to a conference in Scandinavia, uh, and uh, a couple of clients were really, really concerned about the mixing of third-party cookies because they had tried to develop third-party data sources uh, which would be very valuable to build those relationships that you and I are just talking about. Mm-hmm. And they were really worried that they would lose attraction to get there. So anyway, that's, that's, that's. No, it's, it's now. the evolution. I mean, it's just the evolution. And I, I think though it's, it's hard though for a lot of consumer marketers to, um, you know, make that switch. I mean, they know they have to, but you know, it's, it's the, the typical analogy of trying to turn around a, a large, you know, a large tanker, it, you know, rather yeah. than being well, as nimble. Well, well, 
it's also difficult because you know those data sources yeah are the retailer are, yeah. Are, yeah well yeah well retailer giving you the data that's one thing but if you have the sources and you have multiple data sets either because you've you know, systems either because you've acquired the companies or you've built the company by acquisition or because you had different CTOs or CIOs or CMOs you know who didn't worry about it you know they wanted their own systems you know this is the silos at work yeah. or not at work you know causing chaos really but bringing bringing that together is critically important. I was talking to a banking client in Australia, and I said, "What's the biggest issue?" And the biggest issue they said was third party cookies and harnessing all the data. And they have scads of data, huge amounts of data that they want to mm-hmm. use, uh, you know, inside the firm. But getting that data to talk to one another. So a lot of the work we do is very basic work. It's not, as I say, you don't have to be Einstein or it's not rocket science. So I mean, this is pretty simple stuff. Uh, but it's difficult to do. You know, the, our, our win of Mondelez on the content side was driven originally by data and analytics that we did of the sort that we're talking about. No, I I, I, I understand how how critical an issue that is now. Um, and I have I have one last area that maybe we can talk yeah. about because I know I've taken up a lot of your time during a, sure. a very busy week. Um, and that's growth. Um, yeah. You've been quite vocal about growth because you've talked a lot about the churn on the FTSE 100 or on the Fortune yeah. 500. Um, you know, they, the the companies there now are not were not there a decade ago, and and so on and so forth. Yeah. So let me just ask you philosophically, I guess. You know, are the long term survivors simply focused on going where the growth is, and if so? What does that mean to marketing? I mean, maybe not an easy yeah. final question, but I yeah. think that's on yeah. everyone's mind. Yeah, well, you know, I'm an old man. I'm 75. That's the reason I got a vaccination last night. So I'm, I'm part of the vulnerables. Um, I, I don't and, think of and, you as vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I've you know, been at, at, at this for, you know, what, about, about 44 years or whatever it is with Sarches and, and I remember. WPP and now, now S4. And, and um, you know, it's a bit tiresome to dealing with, um, you know, 1% or 2% growth or 3% growth or 4% growth. So, yeah, and, I, and the market rewards, you know, we're a listed company, and the market rewards us uh, if we have growth. They do not reward us if we don't. So maybe when I started at Sarches or WPP, uh, the the stock market would award you know fifty percent to top line growth and fifty percent to margin. Now I would say it's seventy five percent to top line growth and twenty five percent to margin, or two thirds one third. So the key driver of total shareholder return uh, is top line growth, and for my welfare and peace of mind, <laughs> instead of having to struggle. You know, I watch the white-faced CEOs, all of whom are male, by the way, of uh, the holding companies uh, struggle with this, you know, and come out every quarter with the excuses or come up with new excuses as to why they didn't get any growth, you know, how they were doing uh, digital or how they were doing e-commerce or, or whatever, or they made this acquisition that was it. And then, you know, it never, it never computes. And so I just don't want to deal with that. So. What we will try and do, uh, you know, we're in the sweet spot. I mean, one, going back to your very first question, uh, the sweet spot that we're in has become sweeter. You know, mm-hmm. The purely digital mm-hmm. sweet, sweet spot, which this year is going to grow by 20%, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the holding companies, if they can't grow their revenues this year, they never will because they fell by 5 10 15% last year. And the market, you know, uh, the market will are saying this year the ad markets will be up twelve percent, digital up twenty, and traditional up a little bit, three, four, five percent, whatever it is. But the growth is still going to come from digital, and digital will be seventy percent of the market by twenty twenty four. So the answer to your question, Deborah, is is mm-hmm. growth is the priority. And and if you're weighed down, if you have an albatross around your neck, and if you're sixty percent of your business is traditional. It means that you know your your uh, digital business is has to do even better because it's dragged down 
the, the holding companies are like the investment, the, the, the banks. You remember after the great financial crisis, there were good banks, or, yes. or good parts of the banks and bad banks. And, you know, if they could, I'm sure every CEO of a holding company would love to get rid of the analog business and you know, focus on the digital business. Um, they complicate matters by mixing the two up so that they become almost inextricably interlinked, probably at the time when they should be separating them. But it's very difficult to do, to be fair. Um, and that's why I think they should be broken up and um, the value should be uh, unleashed. I mean, also because the people who run them are managers. They're not owners. They're not entrepreneurs. They're managers who really, you know, their, their, their modus operandi or modus vivendi is, you know, I want a job. You know, I, I want my job. I want my perks. I want my salary. They have nothing at risk. And um, I think that's, the you know, coming back, you, you, you mentioned at one point in our conversation about post-Brexit Britain. You know, post there has to be a new mercantilism inside Britain as a result of Brexit. I mean, we've had, you know, the problems around globalization and digitalization, which everybody has faced. We've had the problems of corona, which everybody has faced. The unique thing to Britain is on top of all that stuff, we have to deal with Brexit. You know, today, the EU... Ursula van der Leyen is talking about putting restrictions on vaccine vaccines being distributed outside the EU. I mean, we're getting into some colossal, um, colossal issues, um, competitive issues. And I think Britain, you know, on its own, I didn't vote for it. Um, I don't believe, but look, the dice cast. So there has to be a new effort, a new business effort that is critically important. So. Part of the reason why I wanted to do a lot at the beginning of the year was really to signal that, you know, we, we are, I mean, we are, the UK is five, 10 percent of our business. So it, in the realm of things, it's not it's not big. But but it, our thinking is we had to expand coming back to one of your questions into the Americas, into Asia, Asia Pacific and into the Middle East and Africa. Well, there's so much to talk about, and I hope you can come back because one thing I'd love to love explore. To. Well, I'd love to explore with you in the future as we talked about growth. What this whole emphasis now on uh, stakeholder capitalism means to sure. shareholder capitalism. So, look, maybe we can just well, say I'll give, to I'll, people, I'll give, yeah, I, 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 yeah I, but I'll just give you one view. On it. I, I, you see, I, 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 you know, there's more stuff today. I mean, Larry Fink, you know, who's the biggest investor of course. in the world, you know. Yeah. Uh, now, now, zero emissions. We've committed to zero uh, zero emissions by 2024, so we, we'll meet his 2050 target. Uh, but look, I have to say, uh, I think we overcomplicate this stuff. If you're in business for the long term, you look after all your stakeholders and your constituents. You make sure your people are looked after properly. You make sure the environment's looked after properly. If you're in it for the short term, That's a which good point. most of those – Managers, by the way, are because on average they last for about five years. Mm-hmm. That's the average length, length of tenure of a CEO. But if you if you have your money where your mouth is, I think you are much more likely <laughs> to look at the long term. So I think it's about long termism. It's as simple as that. No, that's so that's a good point. Right, that, that's all. That's all yeah. I think it is. I mean, no, it's I, a- I, listen. I agree. I agree with all the stakeholder stuff. I mean, it's not. The temperamentally or philosophically, I don't agree with it, but I think we overcomplicate it. And all you have to do is say, I'm focused on the next 5, 10, 15 years, not like private equity. You know, before they yeah, get sure. into an yeah. investment, they're looking at how they exit it after five years. No, I, I so think I that's long, sick. Long-term, long-term brand building. No, it's that, that, that's, that's very interesting that you say that, because I think one of the things that's coming into the conversation now is, is a little bit about how do you build brands for life and, yeah. you know, or at least that relationship and how do you keep going? So look, I won't divert any further. I, I think that was a wonderful place to end it for now. And um, it's always a, a joy to hear what you have to say. And um, it heartens me um, to think that there is a future. <laughs> but more than that, it'll, it'll be, so, so you know, just to finish, twenty twenty one will be it will be great. Once we get through Q two, uh, I see nothing but upside. Ah, and, and I think, and I th- and I think twenty two. But then I get to wor- worry when we get to the end of twenty two, but inflation and mm. interest rates, etc. But for twenty one and twenty two, I, I I'm 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 pretty optimistic. 
Excellent. And we'll and we'll hold you to it. Okay. <laughs> All right, no problem. I'm I'm happy to be held to it. All right. Good to talk to you. Good to talk to you. Thanks Thank you much, so Deborah. much. Thank you. And that concludes today's podcast. Thanks again for listening. For more information on the internationalist, please go to our website, www.theinternationalist.com. Uh, by the way, there's a uh, there's a hyphen between the and internationalist. That's where you'll find more information on podcasts and interviews, as well as highlights of our various initiatives, including Marketing Makes a World of Difference, Internationalist Insights and Studies and Intelligence Briefs, Awards and Case Studies and Best Practices, Peer-to-Peer Marketing Think Tanks and Forums, and the Internationalist Press. The ability to inspire people to be their best selves is valuable in difficult times. We feel very strongly about the fact that no one does this better than one.